Okay, welcome everybody to another one of our guest lectures. We're really lucky to have Dr. Caitlin Curry with us today. She is a postdoctoral research scientist at the Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha and a friend of mine. Um, during both of our PhDs, I went and spent a little bit of time uh, in the lab where she was working down at Texas A&M um, to do some, some research there shortly after I had finished my PhD actually. And, uh, and so I, sp I think I spent like two weeks with Caitlin um, working on some bison genetic stuff. Um, well, really working more with her, her lab because uh, she was doing stuff with lions. Anyways, not to get too sidetracked here, but Caitlin um, is here to talk to us a bit about her career and to answer your questions. So I will turn the time over to Caitlin. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, as Dustin said, my name is Caitlin Curry, Dr. Caitlin Curry, still weird to say, um, and I am a postdoctoral researcher in conservation genomics um, at the Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium. I'm sure many of you have been there. Um, a conservation geneticist, um, we use a combination of ecology, molecular biology, biogeography, bioinformatics, taxonomy, forensics, and goes on and on and on. It's very interdisciplinary uh, to look uh, and understand genetic relationships among organisms to aid in preservation of biodiversity. Uh, so what does that mean? We look at a lot of uh, biological structure, breeding structure, um, differences in population. We're taking a molecular approach to look at populations. So this is kind of my path to getting a career in wildlife conservation. Um, it looks very messy and busy. And the moral of the story coming out of this timeline is that it's not linear. Things don't all happen in a line. It's very, woo, and lots of things happen all at the same time. Uh, so I got my undergrad at the University of Washington where uh, I got a Bachelor of Science in Psychology, um, specifically animal behavior with a minor in anthropology because I thought I, would, I wanted to work with primates. Um, and actually wanted to be an animal trainer. And it wasn't until I was between my junior and senior year when I did an internship with the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia, Africa, that um, I realized I really liked research and I wanted to pursue that. Um, but it was kind of too late in my undergraduate career to go directly into graduate school. So I took some time and I worked and um, what, but while I was in undergrad, I also uh, was a volunteer animal care keeper um, at the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle. So I was you know, working with wildlife, but wasn't kind of pursuing a career in research. I was pursuing a career in just working with wildlife. I wanted to kind of be a zookeeper. Um, then when I was at Cheetah Conservation Fund, we, um, I was approached by Lori Marker, the founder, to work on a project using conservation dogs. Uh, they were gonna use these scent detection dogs to find cheetah scat samples. Um, so they needed somebody who knew the behavioral portion to be able to go on and, and write, propose, write and start the proposal and, and work out the logistics of beginning this project. Um, so I agreed to work on that. And for a few years, I worked on writing the proposals and getting all of the beginning literature, um, which brought me to the next step, which was I got a, a certified in dog training. Um, so as I became more and more involved with this project from the dog training side and the animal behavior side, the what the dogs were going to be c c collecting, the scat samples, were going to be used for genetics. Um, and that became, I was really interested in that. Um, so that's kind of where I wanted to go. If I went to graduate school, I wanted to do something with that. Um, so in this interim, <laughs> uh, I applied for graduate school in 2008 and didn't get in, but didn't take that as this is the end. I must go another route. Um, I got a job working as a volunteer researcher at the San Diego Zoo, because I grew up in San Diego, so I was back, back living at home, and went back and to, took some more classes so I get my, myself a little bit more streamlined and ready for graduate school. Just obviously didn't get in the first time, so I 
figured out what I needed to do, what classes I needed to take, what experience I might have needed to get go in that direction. I still didn't know what exactly what program I was going to get into. If it was going to be ecology, genetics, um, animal science, I didn't know yet. So started taking more courses, started working, started volunteering. Um, and for about five years, I just figured myself out, boosted my CV, boosted my resume. And it wasn't until about 2011, I took a course in genetics at Cal State San Marcos, just for interest. And my professor was uh, a graduate of the Texas A&M genetics program, which is an interdisciplinary program. So it takes in all the different departments, all the different colleges, you have access across the entire university doing projects in genetics. And it turned out that that was the perfect program for what I wanted to do. So I could gear what exactly I wanted to do, which was work in conservation, and I could focus my project in genetics. Um, so I applied for grad school again, and this time I finally got in. Um, and then, so for the next seven years, uh, I went to Texas A&M University doing research on biodiversity of the lion, where uh, it, I got in because of the cheetah project um, and the, the conservation the dogs, but dog was presented with this, with this amazing project, project to be able to work with lions, with lions. Um, um, using museum, museum specimens, museum actually. So I was so looking I at biodiversity of the lion over time, comparing modern populations to historical populations using modern lion material from modern lions as well as going to museums and collecting those um, specimens from museums extracted dna did full panels uh, genetic panels on them and that's what i got my phd in so it was a long winding process um, and now i am at the henry dorley zoo and uh, doing a postdoc working with lemurs. So I've kind of gone back to the primate thing. Um, but I work a lot with applied genetic programs. So we, what, all the information that we figure out is actually being used down the road with um, actual wildlife management programs. So it's not just research for research sake, it's actually being applied to wildlife conservation. So that's, that's my, that's my, how I've gotten here, how I've gotten to a career in wildlife conservation. So now I'm open to any questions. If anybody has of all those questions that I heard that you guys have asked. Yeah, that's great, Caitlin. Thanks so much. It's always interesting. Even people I know, I find out a lot more about their past when we, when I do these and, and, uh, I'm always jealous of the different experiences that people have had to get them to where they are. And while it's, it's generally a, a winding path for almost all of us, I don't think any of us would really trade any of those experiences that we had along the way um, to, to get to where we are. So um, the, the first question was, uh, and you, you may have answered it a little bit, but how did you become interested in the field of conservation genetics in the first place? Um, so it was because of this conservation dog project um, so it was using conservation or using the scent detection dogs to find scat samples. And then those scat samples would be used for genetic analysis. Um, so just needing to write these propo the proposal and the initial project, um, I had to learn a little bit about genetics. I hadn't had much exposure to genetics in my undergrad. So I, you know, from finding out that and being really re realizing like, Genetics is kind of the way a lot of things are going. It's very innovative. You can do a lot with non-invasive sampling. You can, you know, there's a lot of potential in it. Um, so I became mostly interested in it because of that potential. Um, and then the more that I learned about it, the more exciting it became for me. So that's why I ended up going that direction and kind of leaving the animal behavior portion in the past. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember I took a, a biotechnology class in high school where we did a lot of genetics. We had PCR machines right there in our high school and 
you know, we all sequenced our own DNA and compared it to samples on GenBank and different things. Yeah, it was super cool to have in a high school program. <laughs> That's awesome. um, but uh, I, as part of that, I was selected to go to like a, this like special genetics summer program at Utah State University in between my junior and senior year. And I was just like, I don't want to do that. Like genetics, I'm going to be a wildlife person. What do I want to do genetics for? Uh, and then, so I skipped it. Um, and then uh, I started looking at my wildlife degree plan at Utah State when I got there as an undergrad and I noticed that I had a conservation genetics course. It's like genetics, man, what do I need genetics for? <laughs> and then I took the class and I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like there's so many incredible tools that we can use. And um, I was glad I was able to make it a small part of my PhD and I wish that I had more training in it. I ended up TAing that genetics class for a couple of semesters because I, I enjoyed it so much. Um, but it was really interesting. So um, why did you go straight from your bachelor's degree to a PhD without a, a master's in between? So I worked for six years between my undergrad and my graduate. Um, and in that six years, I got an equivalent of a second bachelor's. So it's kind of like getting a master's without having to have done a thesis. <laughs> um, so it was basically because I was non-traditional and it was a long time and I'd had a, I had a lot of work experience. That's why I went straight into the graduate, yeah. getting a PhD as opposed to a master's. Um, Given that, that time period, do you feel like that benefited you to have that much time in between your bachelor's degree and your PhD? Yes. Um, for me, it was kind of like I had, it was, it was more of a work ethic. I was out of the student frame of mind and I was now in a, like, this is my career. This is what I'm getting. This is a, this is a career goal. It's not just to finish school. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it made graduate school more of a job than of education, um, for education's sake, like that research for research's sake. I don't, I, I like having that, that, def, that defined goal. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, it was. Would you recommend going like six years or would it, would you, if you, maybe not six years. Like shorter? <laughs> Um, de definitely taking, I, I think the, the year off before you start taking that moment to, you know, find, not find yourself. I, I hate that like phrase of like, oh, find yourself. Um, but getting yourself out, it, it's cause undergrad and graduate school are completely different. You do have to have a different attitude towards it and you have to, I don't recommend it for people who just want to go into it to continue going to school. You need to go into it and go to graduate school because you have a goal, because you have an ambition, because you, there's something you're passionate about. Um, so having that time where I was kind of, do I want to go to graduate school? Do I not want to go to graduate school? I had the time to figure out that yes, that is that is the direction that I wanted to go with my life because it is going to take up a big chunk of your time. Yeah, and figure out what that your passion is and yeah, and what your passion is, what what exactly it is that you want to do. Absolutely. For yourself. So working with lions, a lot of your research was obviously not in Texas, um, <laughs> where the university was. And I know some of the students kind of, they envision your graduate research should take place near where your university is located. What, um, what are the benefits of kind of like working, having your research be at some other place besides where you're at uh, for school? Uh, well, it gives you opportunity to travel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, with conservation genetics, you don't get to do a lot of field work. It's kind of like once you have that sample, you can do a lot with it and then you just spend all your time in the lab. Um, so being able to you know, go to where your study species is, is kind of like that benefit of maybe not necessarily 
working where your study species is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, what made you want to study lions for your dissertation? Uh, I've always liked big cats. And um, yeah, I had that cheetah conservation fund, um, the cheetah scent detection dog project going. Um, and that proposal is actually what helped me get into graduate school. So I really wanted to continue to do the genetic portion of that project, um, but we couldn't find funding for it. So um, while I was rotating in labs to find you know, kind of where I was gonna set myself up in grad school, um, this lion project was kind of presented as, oh, I've been, my, my PI said, I have this project that somebody has come to me about and we're trying to find somebody who wants to do it. And I was like, I'll do it, I will do it. Lions are awesome. Lions are cooler than cheetahs even, and I love cheetahs. Um, so jumped at it, and now I'm a lion expert. <laughs> yeah. Um, was it, so, I mean, it sounds like the lion kind of work kind of fell into your lap, but yeah. um, typically how hard is it to find work with lions? <laughs> Say what? I said a lot of luck comes into it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so, how hard the is it lion, to find work with lions? The lion genetics community is about eight people. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's hard to break into that. And um, there are some very established groups that are doing lion genetics. Um, and, you know, I was coming in as this, this newbie. Um, so I've had to break through and but now I am part of a group um, called the African Lion Working Group which is part of um, CITES and IUCN and we have kind of a, a, lion, a lion genetics coalition um, so we're all working together now making it kind of um, so we can help each other with resources and everything um, so it might be a little easier now especially if you know who the people doing the research are you can break in a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah. Once you're in, it's a lot easier to be in. Um, yeah. <laughs> breaking in is always difficult. And yes. I found that to be true with the bison world too, you know, so. It um, is a lot about who you know and why networking is, is very important. Absolutely. Um, so, so your work, you mentioned like that you would take DNA samples from museum collections. Uh, how is that done? Um, so we would go to these museums and sometimes you just take a skull and you shake it and whatever falls out, you extract DNA from that. Um, other times we're, we're breaking off small pieces of bone. Uh, we use dried tissue, um, something we call brain crusties. You go kind of like inside the crevice of the skull and kind of scrape off whatever you can. Um, and then you take those back to the lab and you grind the bone down and dissolve it and then extract the DNA from it. And it's a long, arduous, very meticulous process, <laughs> but it gives great results. So <laughs> it, was, it was really fun. It, fe it felt kind of um, almost like I was an archeologist. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's interesting to kind of be able to like look at historical patterns mm -hmm. compared to the current variation that exists. So what are some of the, the genetic variation between lions over the years that you were able to find? Um, so the biggest thing that we found is that uh, about a hundred years ago, the population acted as if it was panmictic, so it was all one continuous population. Um, and that's mostly because of um, something called isolation by distance. The one, they weren't necessarily a full continuous population, but between the different prides, there was enough exchange. So it appears as if it's completely mixed um, north all the way to south, um, including Asia. Um, but now there's enough habitat fragmentation. Um, so those prides are now com like completely isolating from each other um, that we're not seeing a panmictic population anymore. It's actually we're seeing isolated little groups of um, genetically different groups of lions 
Although if you look at them as a whole, there still is only one species of lion, but we can actually identify different sampling locations genetically, whereas 100 years ago, you couldn't do that. Um, but if you look at their mitochondrial DNA, the populations have remained incredibly constant. So you can actually find there's a southern, a kind of southern western or southern eastern, uh, East Africa and West African population. Um, and this is because the lion prides, which are made up of mostly females, um, they all stay the same. They all stay in their one location and the males move between prides and mitochondrial DNA is inherited only through the mother. So prides are staying isolated, have always stayed isolated just because that's what their mating system is. Um, and the males would disperse. So if you look at only mitochondrial DNA, it looks like the population of lions has remained constant over time. But looking at nuclear DNA, which is inherited by both parents, you can see that the actual population structure has changed a lot, has changed dramatically over the last 100 years. Yeah, so we went from having a situation where all these, all these different populations and subpopulations were connected so now they're they're isolated off and they're on their own kind of evolutionary mm -hmm. trajectory. Yeah, yeah. Those male lions can't move between prides across country borders, can't move across big cities, big huge roads, things like that. They have a lot, a lot more barriers now than they did a hundred years ago. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, can you give an example of where your bachelor's degree in more of the animal behavior side of things? prove to be beneficial to your work over beyond just having a PhD in the, the conservation of population genetics. Does that so make sense? The, yeah, yeah. So the fact that my background is in animal behavior, it actually gives me a, a different kind of like view of, of the problem, if you will, like when we're going and, and putting together projects, it's not just genetics, 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 genetics. I actually can see it from this like kind of almost like social science side as well as hard science STEM side. Um, so it's a, it's a wider range. So you can actually kind of see, a, 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 you can see a, the problem a little bit more broader. Um, so I think that's mostly where that animal behavior has, has helped um, and, and also it's like, I'm still interested in animal behavior and that, that behavioral aspect of it. So kind of where the direction that I kind of want to take is using genetics to understand more behavioral aspects like distribution, um, mating systems, things like that, and how we can bring how we can answer that with genetic questions because it's still pretty um, far-fetched <laughs> even to think about answering those questions with genetics because conservation is always a little bit behind in genetics. So it's kind of making me think about it so I can maybe bridge that gap and start answering those questions um, using genetics. Yeah, absolutely. What is it like working at Henry Dorley Zoo? It's really fun. I, I really enjoy it. Um, I, I like working in, in the zoo setting and, you know, having, you know, from my office, I can see the orangutan. So that's kind of awesome. <laughs> and uh, we can see the talkins when the trees are, de are, are dead. So in the winter time, we can see the talkin. Um, but it's also working at a zoo and especially Henry Dorley Zoo because a lot of the programs are, are the applied conservation. So it's different than academia um, in that a lot of the research, once you're finished with it, it's given to someone else for them to do the application. Um, but the application is still in our wheelhouse. We're still, that's st part of our plan is, is, is applying it to the conservation programs. Um, so when the genetic portion of it is finished, we're not finished. Um, it's just the genetics part is finished. So I actually get to see, see these projects 
through to the end to where we're actually saving wildlife. That's really cool. Did, did you always kind of see yourself working with a zoo when you, yes. when you first started? Yeah, my, um, I grew up in San Diego, so I was always surrounded by San Diego Zoo, which when I grow, growing up, it was called Crest. Um, now it's called Institute for Conservation Research. And um, since I was a baby, I wanted to work for Cress and the Institute and, and working for them. Um, so, you know, now as I've gotten older, I know that more than just San Diego does research. <laughs> um, you know, I've always, I've always seen myself working in, in this atmosphere of the, the more of the zoo um, applied conservation. What, if any, are the perks of working at a zoo? And do you ever get to interact with any of the animals or anything like that? Um, I do get to go behind the scenes a lot. So that's kind of cool. Um, I've been able to feed the IIs and hang out with uh, the ringtail lemurs while they do training and things like that. Um, and uh, we're close to the quarantine. So, you know, when we get the new tigers in, we get to kind of, we could see them. Um, but working in conservation at, you know, nonprofits at a zoo, you don't make a lot of money. <laughs> so that's not a perk. <laughs> um, but the atmosphere that you're in is definitely a perk. Um, and I, you know, at lunch, I get to go spend time with animals all I want. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. How much wildlife research does the zoo actually do? Um, a good amount. They support a lot of programs. Um, but the, for the, the biggest project that they do is um, the Madagascar Biodiversity Partnership. Um, and all of the lemur work um, that the genetics uh, department does um, mostly. Um, that's the biggest actual in the wild, hands-on applied research that the zoo does. Um, and that's a really big project because it's not only monitoring lemurs, it's um, also a lot of uh, reforestation, planting trees, and working with communities, and um, there's tortoise projects going on. It's, it's, it's a really, really big project over in Madagascar. How competitive was this job that you have at the zoo? Do you have a sense? Um, I mean, it was, it was pretty competitive. Um, I actually interviewed with one of my best friends. <laughs> Uh, we found out we were interviewing for for the same same job, um, so I think that made it extra competitive. Um, but they they it's a it's a two year postdoc, and um, they they've actually been looking for a person had been looking for a person to fill this position for for uh, some time because um, there aren't aren't that many people that are actually qualified to take the position. Um, which you know makes it that much more competitive because um, there isn't a very big pool of people, and I know a lot of people are interested in it. Do you have an idea what might have made you stick out among the other applicants? Um, I think my background. Um, they had been looking for someone who had experience with um, with. Uh, ancient DNA and uh, difficult to use samples and um, but who had also done bioinformatics and genomics um, so I had maybe not the most experience in all of those categories but I had some experience in all of categories um, so I think that might have been what put me put me over. Plus, I already had experience working in a zoo setting, um, so getting used to not being in academia wasn't wasn't going to be an issue for me. What is your favorite part of your job? Um. Well, before we went into 
social distancing and, you know, <laughs> just it's, do things on a computer all the time. Um, my favorite thing is, is being able to use these, like these big data sets to kind of, it's almost like, um, mind or not mind games, uh, like brain, brain teasers to try and, and sift through it and figure out the best information that you can get from these data sets. Cause, um, I actually get a lot of, uh, data that I, I didn't actually generate it. So somebody else generated it. And now we need to be able to do some, do analyses that are meaningful. Um, so I get to, to play with these data sets and see what they are, how we can work with them and the best avenue to get relevant information out of it. Um, and that's a lot of fun to me. Cause it's kind of like a big mind thought game of Sudoku trying to, to figure out where everything fits. Yeah. Is there any part of your day-to-day -day work that you dread? Um, I do a lot of just sitting behind a computer. And, and I, 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 the, in my postdoc, most of what I do is just data analysis. So I don't get to get out and do field work or anything like that. Um, there isn't a field work component to my postdoc. Um, I, I will get the opportunity to go to Madagascar just to see the programs that all this data was generated from. Um, but I'm not having that like hands-on darting animals and taking samples or anything like that. Um, so the, I think the part that I dread is that I have to sit behind a computer all the time. I mean, it's very interesting information and it's, it's fun to really delve into it, but I am just sitting for a very long time and that makes me sad sometimes. <laughs> yeah. That's how my postdoc was too. I walked in and they had 5 million GPS locations from elk in Montana, nine different elk herds, and they handed it to me and said, go, you know. Yeah, and good luck. <laughs> you, just, you just sit there and stare at your computer screen and try to make sense of it. Yeah. All day, every day. And <laughs> that, that starts to, to, to drain your, your will to live on, on certain days. <laughs> but at least you can look out your window and see the orangutan. It's true. It is true. So how did you choose your research that you are currently conducting? Or was that just kind of part of the, the package deal with the, the uh, It was kind of, it was package deal. So, um, I mean, I chose this postdoc because of the research topic. Like I knew going in um, that I would be doing research, um, that I would be doing genomics of lemurs. Um, but I didn't actually know exactly what the projects were going to entail and what they were going to be. Um, so yeah, they were just kind of handed to me and I, I do get to work. Um, there are a couple of projects that I'm starting from scratch and I do have a, the ability to work the, um, kind of plan them a little bit mm -hmm. and how I want. Um, but what were, what our end goals were kind of like, okay, this is what we're doing. This is, this is. This is what you have to do, figure out how to get there. <laughs> yeah. Why were lemurs selected as like your, your focal species? Um, that is just what this lab does. They do research, they do genetic research on every species of lemur that is in Madagascar. That's, it's their main focus. What is your favorite characteristic that lemurs have? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I haven't been working with lemurs for that long. My main project is on uh, the roughed lemurs, the Varicia. Um, and I mean, they're adorable. I really like them. Um, but I'm a, a one of my favorite characteristics of a lemur is the Safaka lemurs and how they run sideways. <laughs> that, that, I remember that from, what was that? The, the wild the cat, whatever. <laughs> yeah, Exactly, <laughs> when we were kids. So um, I remember, I, I've had like one experience with lemurs in my life. The, the Willow Park Zoo in Logan, Utah, it's this tiny little zoo. 
near Utah State. One of my friends worked there and he would always, whenever I had like a date that I wanted to impress, he would hook me up with like a backstage tour of the zoo and nice. we'd get to feed the lemurs fruit snacks. And, <laughs> and I always remember like how soft the lemurs hands were. Like they were oh, really yeah. soft. Like as they grabbed the fruit snacks out of your hand, they were, they were really soft. So. Yeah, yeah. Random lemur knowledge. Um, <laughs> how do you take what you learn working at the zoo and transfer it into the real world management of lemurs in the wild? So for one of our projects, um, we are, we actually introduced um, a family of lemurs into a new location. Um, so for that one, we are um, looking at those samples and seeing how, um, how the families are actually, how they've split off since they've been reintroduced. Um, see if lemurs from, introduced from different locations are staying together or if they're mixing um, and if they've dispersed out. Um, so if they're staying in that same location or, or, or how they're moving and how they're adapting to being reintroduced back into this area. Um, you know, and that will, that will help us not only with managing that specific area, but also with reintroducing lemurs into other areas because we'd like to do reintroductions of different lemur species um, into kind of some of these reforested areas. So and that's all just from looking at genetics to see yeah, how, that's, how much mixing is taking place or not taking place. Mm -hmm, yeah, every single time that we um, dart an animal or um, to put a, a tracking collar on them. Um, we make sure to get a blood and tissue sample from every single one. So we have hundreds of samples of um, all different species of lemur. Um, so we can monitor them, not just by tracking them, but also um, through their genetics. So this student would like to know um, if you would be looking for an intern to help you learn about lemurs in Madagascar, um, <laughs> either she said, in, or they said in two to three years, um, but I know that your position will be over by that point. But, um, yeah. Maybe, um, you know, th does your, does the zoo hire interns for the summer to help the, with research? The zoo, things, the zoo does hire interns and volunteers. Um, the way to make that happen, um, you can email me. Even if I'm still not there, I know the people to get a hold of. Um, to be able to get a position that's in one of these like research labs, whether it's genetics, um, reproduction, um, or reproductive sciences, or the botany labs, um, you don't really apply through the portal online. Um, you can find out information about it on the website. Um, but if you email one of us within the department directly, then we'll put you in contact with the necessary people at B that B. Um, but if you just send us your, your CV or your resume and a little like cover letter of why you want to be a intern, um, we'll seriously consider it because we like help. Yeah. And again, there's another example of it's, it's as much about who you know as it is what you know, you know, you gotta make sure that your, your resume is ending up on the, the right person's lap, so. Yep. What is your favorite animal to work with? Cheetahs. <laughs> Cheetahs are a wonderful species because they're kind of like a dog, but they're a cat and they're scaredy cats, so you can easily work with them in a captive setting as well as in the wild. Um, plus, they're very interesting because they're so dog-like, even though they're cats. Yeah. So some of the students I know are worried about being, you know, kind of quote unquote locked in to a single species for the rest of their career. Mm -hmm. um, 
what are some of the busy, biggest difficulties with transitioning from your work with lions to what you're doing now with lemurs? Um, so the biggest difficulties is, is, is the background info of your specific species. But the great thing about genetics is that genetics is kind of the same regardless of species. Um, th so those techniques that you use are very transferable across species. So it's really just the background information, knowing where your species from, what their behavior is, what the actual like underlying issue, conservation issue might be. Those, those are the only things that might be difficult to transition. I, I mean, I'm still very much so learning about Madagascar and all the little nuances about every individual lemur species because there's, you know, there's African lion and Asiatic lion, like, that was real easy. Uh, but lemurs, there's oh, over 120 different species of lemur. And, you know, I'm still trying to get my head wrapped around that. Um, but the actual techniques of what I'm using and, and the research that I'm doing is is exactly the same as it was when I was doing the lines. We extract the DNA, you do the sequencing, you do the analysis. It's A's, G's, C's, and T's, and that's what we're, what you're working with. Um, so yeah, it's just that the background information of your specific species is really the only difficult thing. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the things that's some of the most interesting and appealing thing to me about genetic work is DNA is DNA. And my, my conservation genetics uh, professor at Utah State, she worked on everything from like freshwater mussels to aspen to turkeys and just, I mean, she was doing a little bit of everything. It's just as long as it has DNA, you can, you can work with it. So that's kind of, uh, kind of fun and exciting. What are some interesting trends that you're currently seeing in animal genetics and animal behavior in those fields? Um, well, all the start of this uh, third generation sequencing, we're, and that we're actually starting to use it for, um, for, for conservation genetics, um, because it's becoming relatively affordable, and it's kind of an exciting, it's, it's new, it's affordable, it, it's new, it's affordable, and it's actually like attainable for these, for smaller projects because of the amount of information that you can get from a single sample. Um, so that's really interesting that, um, you, you know, usually we're about five to 10 years behind, but right now we're really only like one or two years behind because um, things are coming out onto the market as affordable as opposed to it being really expensive at first and then we're always way behind mostly because of cost. Um, so that's, that's really exciting. We're, we'll be able to do things like high C and, and nanopore and bio nano and all these, these technologies that are, you know, buzzwords. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I don't know what any of that means, but. Right. Cause they're, <laughs> that's how new they are. Yeah. Um, but you can take a, a sample and get a, a whole genome from it and the amount of things that you can do once you have a whole genome is like amazing. Um, so that's, that's really cool. The direction that conservation genetics is actually you know, almost up with the times. Um, and then usually a little bit behind the fields of either like genetic research or, or like human genetics. Yeah, or usually research. A, a good number of years behind, you know, human genetics, for instance. Um, or even like agricultural genetics, because those industries have a lot of money. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting that things are getting more affordable. So we're actually able to do these really cool technologies earlier on. What accomplishment are you most proud of? Um, Becoming an active member of the African Lion Working Group, I think. Um, it's invite only. And it's, because I'm not, I'm, I'm not just a member, I'm actually 
I'm, a, I, I'm the head of a committee. I've held the last two meetings that um, in uh, 2018, it was in uh, Kruger National Park in South Africa. Uh, last year, it was in Impala, which is in, um, which is in Kenya. Um, so I've helped run those two meetings and given talks and kind of I'm involved with getting these, this, these genetic, this genetics group going. And, um, so I think that's, that's, you know, it's a big accomplishment, um, that I'm really proud of myself that I, that I got in there and that it's not just, I didn't just do, do my dissertation and hey, I'm done. I have my degree. Woohoo. No, I'm like, I'm trying to keep it going and, and become a member of that community, not just doing the research. Yeah, you feel a bit more like you've arrived, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, once you get to that. I know I feel the same about, because I'm on the, the bison specialist group for IUCN. And it, it is a kind of a, a cool feeling, again, invite only to, to be invited to, to join a group like that. So um, last, last question, would you have any specific advice for undergraduate students who are interested in uh, a career path similar to, to what you've done in terms of either experiences they should gain, um, classes they should take, anything like that? Um, grant writing. Take a writing course, whether it's grant writing or just a creative writing or writing is very important. And um, the fact that I've taken a lot of writing courses and I work on my writing. Um, I've been told I'm a very good writer, which you know means a lot to me. Um, but it will make your life easier because you're going to be writing manuscripts, you're going to be reading manuscripts, you're going to be writing grants, you're going to be needing to um, get your research out into the world um, and knowing how to write to a lay audience as well as a scientific audience is very important. And a lot of programs don't have that integrated into their individual programs. So you kind of have to do that on your own. Um, so I think that's one of the most helpful things outside of what was required of me um, was, was grant writing and learning how to write eloquently. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a huge one. And it's a challenge because most of us don't want to be sitting and writing. We want to be out in the field yes, watching animals yes. do what they do. So. But unfortunately, well, if, you, if you don't write, nobody's going to know what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. Well, Caitlin, thanks so much for, for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Um, and I will, students, if you have any other questions for Caitlin or if you want, to follow up with her on anything i'm sure that she's happy to um, email me away please <laughs> yeah I'll, i will you know get in touch with me and i will get you her contact information um and uh she's a, a great resource and some that i really value as a friend so caitlin thanks again for your time really appreciate it yes thanks for having yeah. me yep, we'll see you